first topic is I have Cynthia Shippum here from National Research Council and the IRAP program. If you're not aware of the IRAP program or you're, actually let's ask, who here is an IRAP client? Just, oh really? Interesting, okay. So if you're, if you're a new startup, IRAP is one of the most important uh, organizations and resources and tools you will probably have on your journey. So Cynthia's gonna tell you about IRAP, but also all sorts of different government programs that may be of uh, use for you. And she'll also touch a little bit on, because uh, Cynthia's also an intellectual property uh, expert and helps manage um, some IP programming. Patent agent, sorry. Thank you. Uh, and um, uh, so she'll also talk a little bit about intellectual property considerations for US startups. Uh, we will have additional intellectual property talks as part of the competition. And I think I mentioned it in the morning. We also run a program called Accelerate IP, which is all about intellectual property. So consider this just like a bit of a, of a teaser, you know, place, you know setting, setting the scene as to why it should matter to you. Uh, I think that's it, so I'm going to pass it over to Cynthia, and thank you for being here. Okay, am I live? You can hear me at the back? That's okay? Excellent, thank you. Uh, all right, so without further ado, I will dive right in. So National Research Council is NRC, welcome to the government, the land of the acronym. IRAP is the Industrial Research Assistance Program. So if you look at the NRC, and, and take this as a lesson of why you want to pay attention to the color of your slides and your graphics and the way you will present them. This presentation was originally pulled together for Zoom. So the people online, you're getting the primo seat today. There might be a little bit more pain here. And you will get these slides afterwards, so don't worry about scratching down every detail. So the NRC has offices coast to coast who specialize in all sorts of different technical areas from environmental chemistry, AI, um, health therapeutics, biomanufacturing, all that kind of stuff. Um, divide up a, uh, a little regionally, there's super clusters, there's different headquarters and that sort of thing. And there's IRAP offices in all of the provinces and representation in all of the provinces and territories. Concentrated in the big cities, that's just a numbers game, but they're just about everywhere. Um, IRAP has been around for over 75 years. The only government program older than us is income tax. That's going back a long, long way. Uh, we're now to nearly $500 million invested in startup companies, and that number is well over 10,000 firms receiving advisory services now. These are 2022 stats, so a little bit out of date. So that's a lot of touch and a lot of reach. Um, a lot of job supported youth internship programs and we do work for other, with other government departments as well. Um, IRAP is unique and it's got about 250 people with expertise in all different technical areas <laughs> combined with business experience of varying flavors. Um, so it's a really interesting wealth and depth of resources that can be accessed by pretty much any SME in Canada. Our mandate is to grow, stimulate wealth for Canada. Business benefits to Canada are the factors that is what comes out of growing your company. Job creation, sell more product, make better margins, the company pays tax, tax matters here, and investment, that drives the other ones. We're limited, we can't support everything for everybody, but we do want to see that growth. As you can imagine, this is probably competitive, and it is. <clears throat> The front leading point of this are ITAs like myself. I have a PhD in agriculture, an MBA in technology management, and, and as he mentioned, I'm also a registered patent agent. I have 250 of me across the country in all technical areas, advanced technical degrees, PN, PhDs, masters, all sorts of different things. A lot of MBAs are in there, financial backgrounds, CEOs have started companies, sold them, bought them, crashed them. There's nothing like experience to learn from. So we're all coming to this with about 20 plus years in, um, of battle scars and stuff like that. Um, and that's sort of how it starts. We're local, we, we tend to work regionally, um, but that doesn't mean that if you've got some kind of drug discovery technology that has a big AI component and somehow involves quantum computing to figure out the best route, that's fine. I'm a biotech person, but I'll bring my AI and my quantum physics buddies to the conversation. And it's probably one of the only places you can get that mixture of expertise and experience. We are industry sector agnostic. 
As you can see, everything from aerospace to manufacturing, ICT is a big part. Um, but that also captures a bunch of different areas. So digital health, um, AI, uh, AI and aerospace could well fall under there. It just so depends on how it's categorized. And the vast majority of the companies we end up working with are less than 20 people. So we do service up to companies with up to 500 people in them. That's the definition of an SME. That is a treasury board mandate. So if you have 501 people in your company, sorry, I can't help you. Uh, but most of them are in that 1 to 20 category. So nobody's too small. It's just you might not be getting $10 million on day two when you're one person in an idea. But at the end of the day, the goal is to grow. You start out small, you get big. And there's a lot of other stuff that you have to pull together to grow. You need intellectual property. You need your own assets. You need facilities. You need other skill sets and expertise. Um, you need team members who are going to drive things. Some of this stuff involves money, got to hire people, IP, got to pay bills. Other times it's, okay, sit down and figure it out. Who's really out there? Who has the problems? What's my actual market niche? Not what I think it is based on what I know about my tech, but what does the market think? Can be different questions. And this is an iterative process. Um, I, I've heard it said at other places that the goal is to be less wrong. You won't be right because you're chasing a moving target. So be less wrong. And if you sort of internalize that, you won't be defeated every time you find an answer that doesn't align with what you want. So that's okay too. Who are we looking for? As I mentioned, IRAP is competitive. Everybody wants it. We can't do everything for everybody. So you have to hit the basic eligibility criteria. Um, you're incorporated provincially or federally or operating in Canada. 500 or fewer employees and you're growing through innovation. So if you're going to be basically an importer and reseller of macadamia nuts from Hawaii, that's probably not going to fit. But if you're importing the macadamia nuts and doing a value-added process in Canada, turning them into, I don't know, granola bars or peanut butter or something like that, or mac, mac nut butter, you know, let's talk. What's the technology involved in there? All I have to do is grind them. Ah, that's not such an advance. But what if there was some new tech that was needed to figure it out? Maybe there's like an AI component to do um, nut measurement quality. So you only pick the best ones. Maybe that's a possibility. And yes, I'm ignoring my phone. My apologies for that. Um, we look at the business itself. What is the actual business opportunity? Benefits to company are not the same math as benefits to Canada. So yes, we can invest in the company and that's going to help you. But how do you return it to the taxpayer? Hire people, pay taxes. Grow the company, sell the product, better margins. Company pays taxes, that kind of idea. That's the math we're looking at. And what is the potential for this? So you don't have to have it now, but you need to show there's a track going forward. Uh, there needs to be management and financial capacity in the company. Um, you've got to be able to achieve the outcomes you're looking for. What's your plan to get there? So the process matters more than the answer sometimes. And how are you going to commercialize things? We're all smart people. We're all doing a lot of cool tech and a lot of cool science. At a certain point, You've, you've hit an MVP and now you get to show, can I sell my stuff? How am I going to do that? That's hard. And if you spent your career in technical fields, doing the research, advanced degrees, study PhD, engineering, chemistry, nowhere in your degree path have you had a here's how you commercialize your product lesson or class or session. And it's a real mind change and it's hard to do. But we can help with that too. And we also do actually look at the tech. Uh, what are your plans and your challenges? Have you anticipated the risks? How do you get over them? What are you going to do? Sometimes they're unknown. That's OK. Let's acknowledge that. Let's put that on the table and stare at it. How do we fix it? What do we do? Does your team have the capacity to address this? And what is the impact on the firm in Canada? If you're going, oh, well, um, I would pay myself more. That's not going to fly. But if you're like, I have to hire three extra engineers to do this, and this is why and how it's going to grow, that's the conversation we'll have. But it's a selection. It's not a fill out the form, get the money like a grant. IRAP is not a grant. To that point, um, common myths. I have a brilliant idea. Can I get grants? If you're in academia, go nuts. That's what tri council is for. Go do your science. Your SHRC, your um, CHR, your NSERC, all those things. IRAP is not a grant. It's not money at the front end of the process. You have to actually do the work, incur the costs, and then claim the eligible portions back. So what that also means is that the company in question, regardless of their size, 
has to have some financial resources to start with. Otherwise, you can't pay the person and claim it back later. You're, you're kind of stuck that way. So one thing IRAP does not do is seed. You as the startup have to come to the table with your seed money, and that's going to be maybe your own savings, early investment, um, you know, maybe you, maybe you want one new ventures be seen, you got $100,000 to start with, that's a great place to be. Uh, but you're going to put all that together as the money you seed with to get started. And then that's a conversation with. So you do need to make sure you are invested as a founder. One thing to bear in mind, and this is sort of more of a, a fuzzy optics thing, but if you're a startup company and you as the founder have put zero dollars into the company, you're not even betting on yourself. What's, that, what's the message that that's sending? It doesn't be a lot, but you do have to show you're betting on yourself. And then this is where the seed, the blood money, the um, friends and family, the F and F, that kind of idea. You want your own mother, your brother, your family to be betting on you. That's, that's the kind of traction you need to be able to start getting. And it's a process to get there. It's not easy to do, but this is an excellent first start. Another myth, IRAP funding is easy to get. Um, it's very competitive. Matching funds being the key, there's usually, there's paperwork, there's always paperwork, it's the government. But you do want to make sure that you're on top of that and you've got the capacity to handle it. So payroll records, that kind of stuff. Nothing crazy complicated, but you do have to start with the base. And so these are some sort of plus minus factors on, and, and no one thing is an absolute die on the hill point, but if you start adding them up and if all of the criteria, all the boxes you're checking are on that side, that's not a strong position compared to being on this side. Can I take questions at the end just from a flow perspective? Sure. Okay, thank you. So, so ways to think about it. Do I have a prototype built? I don't have any control over my IP because I haven't bothered to negotiate the licenses or I haven't even looked at it. Uh, I have absolutely no business plan. Well, after you do an NBBC, you should have the foundation for a plan and now you build it out, so you've dealt with that one. Um, You've got a sizable market because you've done good customer validation. You've done um, consumer interviews. You've found out what do they really care about. Not your tech, but what's their pain. That totally colors how you approach the situation. And to touch on some other government resources, there is an infinite number of these programs, and they come and they go. So these are some names and acronyms that you do want to follow up with. And then you're going to want to just keep your eyes on things because it moves around. And there is something called a business benefits finder, which is worth tapping into occasionally. So SHRED is the first one. This is the tax credit. If you have an organization who incurs, who expends money on R&D, you've spent it on technical people's salary, you've spent it on consumable things, you've spent it on iterative design, trying to manufacture the widget, and the first one failed, and the second one's a little better, and you keep doing that. Keep all of those models and have a little shelf in your office or your room like the, the wall of learning because that stuff's critical. So when time comes to play the shred game, you've actually got literal and exact evidence of, look, this is an iterative design process. Here's all the failed versions that I fixed. And I've got my books and my documentation talking about my process of solving the problem, not just magic wand poof, I did it, but why was it um, an investigative process? Why did I have to problem solve? Track the time involved in this, the resources involved in this, the overhead involved in this. All of that can feed back into a tax credit. So this is the first step. Um, and usually this is the foundation for even beginning to stop with the dialogue with IRAP. If you haven't spent any money, you're not going to get any tax credits. And you need the documentation in place for this. Get on the mailing list. If you start Googling Shred, they do have workshops on a regular basis. Um, you know, they, they kind of come and go on their own schedule. They want, CRA wants to help you do this right. They have people who will help you with your first shred claim. So definitely take, care, take advantage of that resource. My tax. If you have an academic presence or your tech is coming out of a university, you definitely want to look into my tax. They will be able to support a portion of the salary cost for the PhD or the postdoc who's working part time on your project. I will tell you to contact MyTax or at least start with their web page to find out what percentages, what areas, what do they need to see. Again, things move. Get on the mailing list. NSERC. Uh, it's part of the Tri-Council. If you're in the life sciences, you've heard of CIHR. Uh, NSERC has their Idea to Innovation program. Again, if you are coming out of an academic environment, this is a really key resource to look at 
at the very early stages of development when you're still coming out of the academic space. If you have no connection to academia, that probably isn't going to be a resource you can use, but you may be able to get some R&D support through the Alliance program. You might need to be a little bit more advanced. You might need to grow up a little bit to be able to address your share of the cost with those, but that is another government program that is out there. Again, go to NSERC, have a look. Things change. This is the other one that's the real little gold mine, the Business Benefits Finder. So back when we were kids, we had these choose your own adventure stories. So you read the first page and it's like, if you want to go down the tree path in the forest, flip to page six. If you want to take the car and you know, go for a drive, go to page eight. And then the story would evolve from there. This is a lot like that. You put in information about your company. Um, so many people, I'm looking for this, this is my stage, my demographic, where I'm located. And it's going to spit back a list of here are some programs to look into. It's not a guarantee. It will redirect you to the program websites for eligibility, for timing, all that kind of stuff. Um, things change all the time. There are sometimes application deadlines, so there'll be a, a call with it where everything has to be in by Monday the 32nd. Other times they're open year round, just different programs, different rules. Just always check. And IP. So now we're getting into the stuff that I like. I'm going to change tack a little bit here as I start talking about IP resources. There are several. Um, pretty much none of these start out with the here's a bag of money to pay for your patent. There's a lot of learning involved. There's a lot of investment involved. Uh, the BDC, when you get to a more advanced stage, they actually will invest um, in IP-backed financing. So they will use the intellectual property position and the demonstrated proceeds as foundation for a loan. Uh, can export uh, through the Trade Commissioner Service can also help with non-Canadian activities and costs. Uh, there is Elevate IP, which is national. It's Accelerate IP out here, as Angie had mentioned. IRAP also has an IP program for IRAP clients. Uh, there's the Innovation Asset Collective with a specific clean tech focus. And then there's IP Ontario right now, which is the only provincial one that I know of. There may be others coming. Um, they all have something slightly different. They have some different eligibility criteria, depending on who you are, what you do, what field you're in. Again, there's lots of resources out there, but you have to start looking. So this is a place to start. And I'm going to slip in a few things on IP because I just can't not do it. And how am I doing for time here? OK, I'm, I'm still good. So this is another lesson on do my slides work in the room? Ah, animation. If that drove you nuts, now you know. Don't do animation. So when you're starting to talk about IP, you're actually not going to be talking about patents or trademarks or copyrights at all. You're talking about what's your tech? What are you doing? How does it work? Um, what's the state of your art? Who else is doing stuff? Oh, I'm, I'm unique. Nobody does what I do. No, that, fair enough. But you didn't come out of nothing. You were not born forth from a vacuum. There was an existing solution of some sort, even though it might have been very, very crappy. What is that? And what is that pain? And then how do you speak to how you solve that problem in the context of that pain? It's not about how shiny your tech is now. It's about the pain you solve. Um, who has that key technology? Does your stuff build on somebody else's stuff? Again, nobody exists in a vacuum. So that's really important to know because you might need to speak to you have to license rights in or you have to buy specialized equipment that comes with a license or maybe it doesn't. Every situation is unique, so you want to think about this. Having a patent does not magically solve these. All it does is it lays open on the table what you think is special about you. And so you're giving a lot of information to the wider world. It has other advantages, but if you want to keep everything secret squirrel, a patent application is going to force you to tell everything. So how does that fit in your overall plan? Um, what are your improvements, and how do you capitalize? OK, good, I killed the animation on this one. So from a business perspective, now I want to connect this to my business. I got my tech, now how do I use that? What are the goals of the business to exploit the tech and the advantage and the problem-solving capacity that I have? What's the market look like? Who else is in that space? I have no competitors. I'm completely unique. <clears throat> Wrong. There's always a competitor, even status quo. Even if status quo is crappy, it's still a competitor, and you have to speak to that. Um, what could disrupt you? So what's going to keep you awake at night? You're smart. You've got your tech. You're started. It's like, oh, man, what would something look like if it was completely going to come and take the floor up from under my feet? What would that be? What might that look like? And start thinking about that, because maybe your key elements of IP 
lie in your ability to block that other thing that's going to pull the floor up from under your feet. So it's not just about, I'm smart, here's my code, here's my patent, but it's what is the bigger plan surrounding these things. And IP is a tool. Um, I have heard many people say, oh, I've got you know, six patents, so I'm good. No, you've got a bundle of assets that's going to cost you a quarter million dollars a year in a couple of years. What are they doing for you? How are they earning their keep if they're costing you a quarter million dollars a year? That's a really big question. Um, what is your plan? Do you have an IP strategy? Magic words up there. How do you connect your tech to your business? Where are you going to see them? Where are the gaps? Everybody's got gaps. The catch is you want to be as far forward looking as you can and identify them now and fix them before they become a hole somebody else can exploit. You know, maybe you just put a patent application there to cover a key molecule or maybe you have to um, bring your data onshore, whatever it happens to be. Just lots of questions to think about. These are the things that investors and EIRs and advisors are thinking as well. Not about my tech, but how do you speak to all of these questions? Um, yeah, and what IP do you need? Sometimes a patent's completely irrelevant for what you want. And I'm a patent agent. So if it's not relevant, be able to say why. How did you come to the status that you think it is irrelevant for what you need? You might be right, you might be wrong. But if you explain your rationale, now you've got a dialogue to benefit from. And so I'm going to jump tracks again here to Google. And I will apologize for these being an eye test for the people at the back of the room. This was originally developed for Zoom. So everybody knows how to Google. And I'm going to suggest, this is basically everybody's homework tonight, is sit down, you're, it's a long day, you're going to be tired, glass of your favorite beverage in front of your computer and poke at Google. Go look up, I don't know, see what Lululemon has filed. That's your homework to start with. Not your tech, but look at what Lululemon has done. Um, look at what cat toys are out there. Look at what kind of do, new kind of dog brushes exist. The point is you don't want to get lost in the tech, you want to learn how to use the tool. So we're going to take BioNTech. This is one of the companies that was heavily involved in the COVID vaccine for all the, the lipid bubbles and stuff like that, which most of us have had these things now. Start with something you know. Put it in the top search books, and it's going to look everywhere. It's just going to look for that word in the documents. This is just Google. Or if you say, I don't want to know about what other people have said about BioNTech. I want to know what BioNTech has actually filed. So in the advanced search settings, you can put it down there in assignee where that red circle is. You'll have these slides afterwards, so don't panic about it. But it really makes a difference to cut down on what you need to look at, and also the question you're asking. Maybe you really do want to see who's mentioned by on tech patents, and then you figure out where. Um, well, you're going to get a lot. For even for assignee, there's about 1,900 results. That's quite a bit. So you've got thousands of hits. If you look at this bar graph plot on the right, and this will show up in your advanced settings, this is going to start showing you some trends. So you can see different names, BioNTech SE, AG, a Korean version, RNA Pharmaceuticals, different subsidiaries, licensing bodies, other things, related entities. We don't really know what to do with that information yet, but we know that it's there. Um, the beautiful thing is it's all hot linked. You can click through. We're familiar with that. And you can filter. If you only want to see stuff that's in English or Korean or Japanese, you can filter it there. You can look for only issued things. You can look for stuff that is in litigation and filter it. So that's where the Lululemon one comes in handy because they have had bun fights over their patents. We've clicked through to one of the titles. This just happened to be RNA formulation for immunotherapy. I don't really care what it is. It's just an example. Two key things to look at here are the number of countries that they've filed this in. That's a lot. That, if you find a patent where they filed it in armloads of countries, that's a really big economic signal saying this technology is important to us and we will fight for it, defend it, we have invested in it. But it's also a really hot area where there's reason to do this. So it's telling you, hey, this is a good thing to do. If you do a search and all you find is a bunch of dead things with no countries, why? Are you now chasing technology that is old and dead? but you didn't know that? Or is there a common problem they all came across? You see this with a lot of software and ICT things, is they're almost too early. The patents were filed and published and everything else, but the actual practical means of making it a business hasn't, didn't catch up yet. So the computers weren't fast enough, or the internet wasn't good enough, whatever. Okay, what's that mean? 
Are you now looking at something where the, the world has changed, but the patents are dead? Could be. How are you going to handle that? And that feeds back into the questions earlier. How do you think about your business? The other really handy thing, is now that you've got like 100 zillion documents, is the classification code over here. This is like a basket. It's somewhat human curation. And it gets around keyword messiness. You can describe things with, you could talk about a dog as a mammal, as a canine, canis, domesticus. Those are all dog. And if you did only one keyword search for dog, you'd miss other things. Classification codes can help you with that because somebody will put all other things to do with dog, canis, et cetera, in that basket. A little more complicated to play with. You have to fiddle with them, but can really accelerate finding stuff. So we can also look at people. Um, again, sticking with the lipid nanoparticles, I throw in Peter Cullis. He's our UBC prof who was one of the founding fathers of lipid nanoparticles and stuff like that. So he's all over the place. 119, 120 documents. I specifically listed him as an inventor. So I don't care where he was mentioned. I want to see where he was an inventor. Again, I can look over here at the filing dates, and I can start seeing the trends of where has he done business. He's done business with Techmera, with UBC, with the Lipizzone company. So if this was a competitor's technology that you were looking at in your industry, you'd start seeing who else they were having dinner with, or in bed with, or what company died and became something else, because companies evolve. Now you're starting to see the background family tree. None of this has to do with can I get a patent or not. It's about all of the business and commercial intelligence information that is available at your fingertips in Google, because patents are marvelously well curated with the additional economic value flag of how much effort have they put into it. So we pick one patent and we click through. Now we're looking at other people who have worked with him. Find prior art, find similar art worth looking at. I found something that's totally unique. Google has already used machine language to scrape the internet and said, no, 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 there's other stuff out there. Look at that. You never know who it is. But we're going to use an example. We'll click through an inventor. We'll see what Ewan Ramsey does. So there's his patents. We look over here, and we can see that, oh, now he's worked in a few different places with Peter. UBC, Precision Nano, trustees of Boston University. Huh. Does that mean Boston University might be a useful place to look for collaborators? Or other technology you might license in that could be a competitor? Or, 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 what does it mean? Maybe it doesn't mean anything, but maybe it's another way around an obstacle that you've found. You can also click through the inventors and the uh, classification codes, and again, see how things are used. So if you're in this industry sector and you want to do classification code searching, this is going to show you where some of these things are. This is one to screenshot for the folks at home. Definitely grab it. If you want to take a photograph, off you go. These are all free and public resources to search patents, search publications, find things. Um, IEEE, PubMed, we know those for research. There's Google Scholar. Trademarks are another one. If you've got a bunch of company names you keep seeing, what kind of trademarks are they filing and in what countries? That's going to tell you where they might be thinking they want to sell. Their patents may not overlap perfectly with that, or maybe they don't file patents at all because it's just not relevant to their business or they've made a decision. Uh, if you're in the life sciences, bugs, drugs, diagnostics, you're probably going to want to have a look at clinical trials, see what else is out there. Again, that's telling you who the network of neighbors and collaborators are. And with that, I will stop. I will take questions if we've got some time. And um, there we are. Depending on whether you're too early or not, you might want to check the call center for um, IRAP eligibility. If you haven't incorporated, you're going to be too early. You might want to wait for that. If you have no money, no investment, it's just you and your idea, you might want to wait a little bit. But there you are. So thank you very much. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, yeah, that Google patent demo, it's like just rabbit hole, clearly. Oh, yeah, you can go for months. <laughs> so set a timer for sure, because you can go for days on this. And that's actually the next step. Now I've done this, and I'm in this bottomless rabbit hole. How do I know when to stop? And I don't know. It's like saying, you know, how long is a piece of string? I have no idea. So there was one question around the back. Ah, there we are. Yes, that was the first one. I'll get to that. There's some okay. online ones, and I'll get to you. So just a couple uh, eligibility questions uh, from online. What if your tech teams are based overseas, and you want to hire overseas, but you register your IP in Canada? I assume this is a question around IRAP eligibility. 
Yeah. So where you register your IP is not the IRAP factor. Uh, it, just because you filed at CFO does not mean you're magically going to get all your IRAP resources. That's not what we look at. Though you might want to explain why you've only ever filed things in South Africa. It's like, well, what's going on over there? Oh, well, actually, we manufacture our stuff here, and that's our primary market. Oh, well, that makes sense. Hiring overseas it happens a lot for tech development and stuff like that. Uh, usually, that's not where you want to be starting because that doesn't address the job creation question in Canada. It may address some of the profitability in Canada, but it's, pre it's a hard push on that one. Okay, what about another what if on eligibility? Subsidiary with a Canadian partner operating in Canada. Uh, this is a nice big fat, it depends. We would want to know about that company. Again, looking back to the benefits to Canada. How does the IP, the wealth creation, the job creation um, occur, accrue in Canada? Those are the questions we would ask. Okay, uh, there's a question on Shred. We will be doing a one hour Shred sessions uh, probably in the next month or so. Okay, good. I believe, uh, you might know the answer to this one though, Cynthia. Uh, shred spending has to be done in Canada, correct? Yeah, I think it's pretty hard to claim a Shred credit for spend that is outside of Canada. So if you had an entirely offshore dev team, but your project management was here, you might be able to present a situation that would be worthy of a shred considering. You'll notice I'm not saying yes or no. I am deliberately avoiding this because it's not my decision. It's the tax man. But there's usually ways, and sometimes it's a record keeping exercise as much as anything else. Okay, and then there's one IP question online, then I'll go over to you. I think it was Prashant I saw there. So are there cases in which secrecy works better than filing a patent? Absolutely. So there, there's never, I want to say never. The you should always and you should never are, are very loaded statements that you want to really avoid using if you can. A general rule to think about is if somebody had my tech and they could very easily reverse engineer it, then Patents are probably the better way to go. But if my, person, my tech happens in a locked room or in a black box where nobody can see what it is, then maybe secrets are a better way to do it. Usually there's a little bit of crossover. Uh, you'll see a lot of methods, method for manufacturing a thing. Okay, if all of that manufacturing is happening in a locked room with no windows and nobody's in there, um, as soon as you write a patent, you're going to be telling everybody about it. Is that what you want to do? Sometimes it could be if you want to preemptively drop a publication to stop somebody else from putting a roadblock on you. But you've now committed yourself to that path of action, and is that worth what you want to pay and everything else? So those, the, the reverse engineering test is usually the first one I start with. And you start drilling into the details of the business. How will you do business? Will you be licensing this out? Will you be selling it? You go from there. OK. Uh, Cynthia, back on page 14, you, there was a point on collaboration. You briefly touched upon that. Could okay. you expand on that, please? On slide 14. Was that one of the myth ones? Uh, it was on the process side. I think mean, if you go back to page 14, oh, it was on the process, I guess, is it, it, it what I, I saw it. <laughs> yeah. There? There, yeah. Ah, so, yeah. Yeah, you, you mentioned that you know, funding is competitive, documentation is required, et cetera, et cetera. You mentioned also collaboration. I know you briefly touched upon it, but if you can expand on that for everybody's benefit, what okay. does that collaboration look like? So there's, there's a range of different IRAP instruments. Um, if you're do, interested in doing collaboration with overseas partner, you've got a, a, a potential partner in Germany, and your tech plus their tech makes new stuff that everybody loves, that's a really great collaboration opportunity. There are some colors of money that are only for things like that. So you won't, can't access that color of money without the collaboration. So it really kind of depends on what you're doing. If you're a, a one-person band and you're not hiring anybody, you're not working with anybody, and you're doing everything in a silo, in a locked room, with no windows, okay, how, how is that working? Collaboration is called forming your team too, right? So how are you going to grow your team? So. Um, I had a question just regarding software. Uh, most of the, or I don't know about most, many of the companies here are doing software or just AI applied or some AI platform. Um, I'm wondering if, it's kind of hard to answer question, but I'm wondering if you have just a general idea of do patents ever 
fit well in that space, or in what situations might patents be kind of a good thing to look into for a company that is just making ones and zeros in the end of the day? Okay. You, you touch on an issue that is um, certainly dealing with technical stuff, but also borders on philosophy, right? And so you get a little fuzzy about this. So there's already been court cases in the States and in Europe, I think in the UK specifically, about an AI may not be an inventor, right? So that's borderline philosophy, but then they put a line in the sand. Um, it depends on the details of what you are doing. So if you think about your ones and zeros, if your only way you can describe what you do is an algorithm for blah, and the algorithm is a black box, algorithm equals math, so your first patent claim is basically going to be do math, a magical event occurs, and I get an answer. That will fail examination from a patent perspective probably because of an abstractness. You haven't delivered sufficient detail for one of skill in the art to do it. And so that's going to fail the patent side, and then you go, okay, what's it really worth? The other thing is to look at the timelines. If you're doing something really quick, hit, go, fast, technology's changing as fast as you can, patents are like, huh? Still getting out of bed while well, you've already sold your business. So a patent may not make sense from a timeline perspective for your business, which has little to do with the tech. But there may be other people out there, third parties, who you'll find when you Google, who have filed patent applications all over the place in your space. And so no matter how smart you wanted to be, they've already thrown out basically the prior art that would be cited against you. You're not novel, you're not inventive. If they have issued claims, they might come after you and whack, try to whack you with a stick because you're mowing the grass, right? Patent trolls, non-practicing entities, they play in this space as well. And um, there's no chance to license or co like to collaborate with them because they don't manufacture anything. They just enforce a patent and beat you with a stick. So it's not a yes, it's not a no, it's the devil's in the details. And if you have to write a patent claim that's so detailed that you have to be standing on one foot facing east wearing red socks in January, that's not really good for business application, at which point I go, eh, what's that really worth? So it, it's, it's a gray area. So, um, it's a lovely legal answer. It's not going to keep the engineers happy. <laughs> Hi, Cynthia. Um, uh, I'm here. Oh, over there. Hi. <laughs> yeah. So my question was, um, how does IRAP um, funding work around IP that is licensed in other geographies or countries and not in Canada. So it is still novel, but maybe it has worked and being applied in another geography and not in Canada. Ah, so we, we'd be looking at the market at that point. So say you've got to, um, I'm just going to cook up an example and make it up in my head just as it gives me something to speak about. And talking about abstracts of virtuals of what ifs that might kind of sort of happen becomes really confusing. So it's useful to break it down to simple examples. Um, I'm manufacturing peanut butter sandwiches. There are no peanut butter patents in Canada, but there are in the United States. I can do all I want with my, assuming there's nothing else, yes, I could sell my peanut butter sandwiches in Canada. I could probably even make peanut butter here, but I wouldn't be able to cross the border. Um, now, the fact that those documents exist in the States on how to make peanut butter would mean I probably couldn't get a patent claim in Canada. But the person who only has rights in the United States doesn't have them in Canada. Patents are jurisdiction specific, so are trademarks for the most part. So your rights end at the border. Same thing as if you've got a Canadian patent, that's great, right? It's like, that's only really going to help you in Canada. So what does the rest of the world look like? If you're planning on operating a company in Canada, but your primary market is in Mexico, South America, Brazil, and Japan, and that's where your competitors are going to come from, then maybe that's where you need to file, not so much Canada. So these are the factors you have to look at. Every situation is a little different, but you do need to examine it. If that company's got patents in other countries, why didn't they file in Canada? And you know, that's an open question. So that's what I would be looking at as well. Uh, hi. Hi, Cynthia. I have a question. Uh, let's suppose if you choose to keep your process as a trade secret okay. instead of filing for a patent, and later somebody else files a patent for that, can they come after you even if you were doing the same thing much longer before they filed? Yes and no. <laughs> so this is a situation that actually is contemplated by case law. It does happen. Um, they would need to probably reveal their secret. Now it's going to become an argument of who's doing the thing, or vice versa. Um, you, they might be able to stop you, but only as of certain dates of when claims were issued or information was published and stuff like that. So it's possible. 
It's not going to be a free-for-all either way. You're going to have some kind of discussion happening, but the details are going to depend on who said what when, when things went on sale, who the other party is, that kind of stuff. So you, you do need to go to the next layer of the details. Um, and some of the information can get hard to find out. Or they may come after you for damages. But if they can't actually put a number around it and say, you caused me to lose X dollars in sales, eh, they're not going to get a lot. And we know that they'll do that because we have the um, Percy Schmeiser and one after Monsanto in Canada. And at the end of the day, um, you know, they were su everybody suing everybody else. But there were no damages because it costs the same amount of gas and water to plant Roundup Ready canola as it does regular stuff. So those things do matter, but also speaks to why you keep your records. How much did it cost you to sell in what country and why? Because if you ever had to go back and track that stuff for 10 years in the past, you haven't. So it speaks to the importance of record keeping, too. So it's a lo another lovely non-answer. <laughs> Okay, uh, I've got one online and we'll do one in person, then we're going to wrap, wrap no this problem. up. Uh, so just an eligibility question, do you need full-time employees to be IRF eligible? Usually you do need one full-time employee. Um, that is as much of a, and I don't say usually, it is as much as a metric of commitment as anything else. Remember, it's competitive. If I have a company with six people working on it and three of them are full-time in that company, so they've taken the personal risk to be full-time in there. And I've got this one over here who has zero full-time people, won't give up the full-time day job. Who am I going to bet on? Which horse is going to win that race, right? And so that's what you're balancing. So that's why it's, you're not as competitive if you have no employees and have no money and have, have nothing to start with. That, that's usually how it shakes out. Hi. Hi. Uh, I have one question. So coming back to the question of uh, algorithms, Yes, algorithm is mathematics, but it's also lines of codes, right? Yep, method, and, yes. And let's say somebody came up with a mathematical equation for an algorithm, but as a programmer, I can change it any way I want. So the first question is, is that a new AI that I can file patent on? Another question is, can I file a patent on using that specific type of AI in a specific field of application. Is that possible? And if I combine them, is it airtight? Or how does it work? What's my answer going to be? <laughs> it depends. It depends, exactly. Gold medal for you right here. So you're absolutely right. It depends. So if somebody has a patent for all of peanut butter, and you just want something exclusively for peanut butter in Canada, you could probably get a field of use license. Or you could find a way to negotiate. You get this, I get that. that that's pretty common, actually. It happens quite a bit. Um, anytime you take an algorithm, you can boil it down to or write code. Code is just a method. It's a series of steps, right? Do A, do B, do C. Sometimes they must be in a fixed order. Other times, they can shuffle around a little bit. When you read some of these patent applications, you say a method for determining whatever they do, um, you'll see that. The steps comprising step, 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 step. Nothing in that claim says you have to do this step before that step. You could reverse them. Now, if it says first, then second, then third, it speaks to that specific order. If there is an advantage to limiting to that specific order that makes your business possible, then yeah, you might be able to make an argument for that, about why that is patentably distinct, and therefore why they might or might not be able to come after you. You're getting very, very fuzzy. Um, it really does depend on the details and of making sure you've got good legal IP advice on that. So people who are lawyers and agents who actually prosecute in this space because they have these arguments all day long. If you're in that situation where it's really boiling down to that fine level of detail, like maybe you got a nasty gram from somebody else who wants to sue you because you're using their stuff, you want to get to the bottom of that very quickly and you don't want to wait around. You're going to have to invest in good advice if that's the case. So I don't want to say it is possible, and I want to say it's not. But is it a bun fight you want to sign up for? Sometimes it's not worth it. And in AI, a lot of the stuff kind of happens in a black box. Like, we put this in, a magical event occurs, and we get something out. You're not going to be able to get a patent unless you can describe what's in that black box as a ma magical event. Now, how detailed? Another question entirely. So it's, it's a mushy space. You will do better in the long run by demonstrating a certain amount of customer traction and stuff like that as well. That, that's how you want to make sure you're getting stuff started. 
Am I good? You're good. Thank yeah. you so much, Cynthia. One more time, let's give her a hand.